Good afternoon and good morning to everyone from coast to coast and welcome to today's webinar, Don't Leave Your Facilities Needs a Chance, What Campus Leaders Can Do When Rolling the Dice Doesn't Work. Uh, today's session will feature Caroline Johnson, uh, the SHEADS Regional Service Manager for Sightlines, and Dr. Tim Carey, uh, he is the Associate Vice President and Chief Facilities Officer, Officer at, at Ithaca College. My name is Eric Nolan, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at Sightlines, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to have you on the call. Uh, I will be monitoring today's session as Caroline and Tim discuss how Ithaca College was able to tie their deferred maintenance study to the program needs of the institution by incorporating a building portfolio analysis to inform master planning initiatives across campus, and ultimately uh, what, what the outcomes were for the campus. Also, as the title of the session would indicate, we plan to have some fun with telling Ithaca's story today to help you really visualize the thought process and bring their story to life. Uh, but I won't spoil Tim and Caroline's fun now. Uh, I'll let them tell you all about it when they get started in a few minutes. Now, before we get started, I'd like to express how thrilled we are uh, to have Tim join us today as our member speaker. Tim has been with Ithaca College for over two years now, and prior to his time at Ithaca, Tim worked with Montclair State University in a number of positions, including Director of Administrative Operations, Director of Continuous Quality Improvements, and Executive Assistant to the Senior Vice President for Administration. Uh, he was then asked to transition into facilities about 10 years ago. Tim holds a doctorate in Education Policy, Theory, and Administration from Rutgers University, and his dissertation Total quality management and higher education, why it works, why it does not, was really the nexus that led him into the facilities area. Tim, would you like to expand a little bit more on, on your background for everybody? Uh, sure, Eric. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning, folks. Uh, it's really good to be with you today. Uh, just the, the one thing that I just wanted to expand on beyond what Eric mentioned is that my position at Ithaca, uh, just as, as Eric mentioned, is just over two years old. And this is my initial foray as a chief facilities officer. And I think that that's, that really aided in the, uh, the story that we're about to tell. The fact that I was new to the institution and new to being a CFO um, turned out to be uh, real positives to the process. Thanks, Tim. Uh, lastly, Caroline Johnson has been with Sightlines for over five years. She's a graduate of Quinnipiac University here in Connecticut and has worked with Tim a few times over the past year on some pretty high-profile presentations, most recently at Sightline's annual Insight Summit member event. Uh, that was last year. Uh, so we're excited to have the opportunity to connect them both again today, and we know that you all enjoy the engaging conversation between these two as we move forward. So a big thank you to both Caroline and Tim. Now let's quickly review today's agenda. First is a quick introduction to Ithaca College and a little background on their partnership with Sightlines. Then Tim and Caroline will share how Ithaca College use facilities benchmarking analysis and the building portfolio assessment to inform master planning initiatives across campus. At that point, we'll wrap everything up, review the key takeaways from today's session, and finally share some concluding thoughts. We'll also be setting aside some time at the end of the presentation to respond to any questions or comments that are submitted along the way. With this in mind, I'd like to remind you if that if you have any questions or comments during the presentation for either Caroline or Tim, please don't hesitate to share those with us as you think of them. We want this to be an interactive session, and we very much look forward to answering any questions that come up along the way. I'll be monitoring them throughout the presentation, and as I mentioned before, we'll do our best to address each and every one of them towards the end of the presentation. To submit a question or comment, simply enter it in the questions box on your GoToWebinar window pane, and they will be sent directly to us. To answer one question up front that we typically receive, following today's session, each of you will receive an email that contains links to both the presentation slides that you're going to see here and the webinar recording for your continued engagement with this material. Uh, we'll also be sure to include some complimentary content uh, that we think you might find valuable. So keep an eye out for that email tomorrow. And with that, uh, I will wrap up here and pass it off to Tim to get us started. Take it away, Tim. Thank you, Eric. Uh, if we could just move, that's perfect. Moving to this slide, the, um, a little bit of background about Ithaca College. Uh, some of you may be aware, some of you may not, but we are located in the uh, Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. Uh, our campus is, is located on a, in a picturesque uh, area that overlooks not only the city of Ithaca, but uh, the largest of the Finger Lakes, Lake Cayuga. So we're, we're really fortunate in the, the geographic location that we're located. 
Uh, we are a private residential college. We have more than 80, 80 buildings, as you can see. Uh, a majority of those buildings, well over 50, are residence halls uh, between traditional and uh, apartment-style residence halls. And about 4,400 of our students uh, actually live on campus. So that's just a little bit about who we are. As you can see, we've been with Sightline since 2006. Great. Thanks, Tim. And thank you, Eric, for introducing both Tim and I, and Tim for sharing your story with us today. As Eric mentioned earlier, we do plan to have a little bit of fun with today's session. If I had to guess, for most of you, this probably isn't your first time sitting through a webinar or a presentation or a meeting on deferred maintenance, whether as an attendee or someone that's actually educating a group of individuals. As we assume that to be true, Tim and I wanted to give a new lens to consider this topic through. For some, this might help you or your peers visualize the problems we're facing across our aging campuses in the US. For others, this might simply be a way to lighten the mood around the topic. Um, either way, I think you'll find that facilities management is very much like the game of Monopoly. And when I say that, I want you to consider that in both facilities management and in the game of Monopoly, there are numerous key players and constituents involved, from you yourself as chief facilities officers or directors of facilities, to deans of the various colleges, to the students and the campus users that you're servicing on a daily basis. Of all of those players and constituents, we each have different priorities than one another. In facilities, we're very concerned with keeping up with our buildings and making sure that our funding matches or meets the needs of our facilities, where those focused on the education side are very much concerned about the programmatic demands of our buildings and how we can better service our students. Like Monopoly, in facilities management, strategic investments are required, although these are definitely not of the fake money sort. We are definitely looking at large sums of money on annual and daily basis. Lastly, different properties hold different values. Just like in the game of Monopoly, certain properties yield a different return on investment. And we want to make sure that our funding strategy matches those properties. So as you can see, when we look at it like this, facilities management is just like Monopoly. And Tim is going to share with us a bit more of how Ithaca was able to play this game. Tim? Yes, thanks, Caroline. Yes, in keeping with the uh, Monopoly theme here, uh, March of 2014, I was brand new to Ithaca College, uh, and it was, per Monopoly, it was indeed time to get moving. In fact, day one of my tenure uh, at this institution was the master planning kickoff meeting. Prior to my arrival, the senior leadership had selected a master planning firm out of New York City, Perkins Eastman. And on my first day, as you, as you all may recall, your first days at your institution, you go through the HR orientation. Um, my staff was kind enough to set up a lunch, and we had a, a quick lunch, and then the entire afternoon was the master planning kickoff meeting. So it was a, uh, with apologies to FDR, it was a date which will live in infamy for me. It was a, quite a busy day. Um, after that kickoff meeting, as we're digging into our master plan, I began to hear from folks in my organization about the deferred maintenance issues and the backlog and the challenges that they were having. Um, as you can imagine, this is one of those subtleties that were not shared with me uh, during the interview process. It's something I learned as I, as I arrived. Um, during the same time period, I noticed on my bookshelf in my office there was a report, a Sightlines report. Well, I picked it up and it was to, to suggest that it was covered in dust is an understatement. I, I blew it off and it was like a midwinter Ithaca snowstorm. And it was interesting to me because I had interacted and met with some Sightlines folks in, in my prior life at, at Montclair State in New Jersey, but we as an institution had never engaged them. So I had never worked with them, but I knew some of the work that they were doing. Um, as I learned about the things that, that Sightlines could provide, and the fact that I had the master planning initiative on my plate front and center, I began to think, how can I ensure that our master plan can, be, can include the condition audit of our campus 
so that the two plans together could really guide facilities for the next decade to two decades. So there are a few things that Sightlines and Ithaca had to discover before we really jumped into the building portfolio solution analysis. The first thing that we wanted to look at was based on our ROPA Plus data, we had some key story elements for Tim and the team to consider. First, when we compared the Sightlines database of constructed space and also the era in which the buildings were built, we found that Ithaca followed suit with that of our database as the slide depicts. 58% of Ithaca's constructed space was actually built during that post-war era, that yellow line on the chart, compared to 56% of our entire database. This post-war era is an era where construction was of lower quality, as the higher ed sector was reacting to herds of students coming into our college campuses. So as a result, space was put up very quickly. Materials were of lower quality, and the configuration of the space was pretty poor. Across our database, we are now feeling the burden of this building boom with huge levels of deferred maintenance, as I'm sure many of you can depict or visualize some of those buildings that fall in between 1951 and 1990. While Ithaca can certainly find comfort in not being alone in this deferred maintenance issue, it still remains a huge part of their story, as Tim will discuss a bit more now. Yeah, just to fill in a few of the other gaps, if you notice on the uh, far left side where the yellow line begins for Ithaca College, actually begins in 1892 when Ithaca College was founded as a uh, music conservatory. It was actually downtown in, in the uh, city of Ithaca where this was located in, in one building. Uh, in 1960, you see the huge spike, and that's because the, the property that I had mentioned earlier was purchased and a building boom commenced. Um, so as the graph illustrates, and as a factor of our history, and also as Caroline just referenced, the majority of our buildings were constructed in that post-war era. However, I think it's also noteworthy that 31% of our buildings were constructed during the current complex period. And that's an important distinction that I'll refer to uh, in a few moments. Additionally, when we talk about age at sight lines, the previous chart was referencing the date in which the building was actually put up. And then we have to consider our renovation age, which suggests that if a building undergoes a, a major overhaul or a major replacement of the building systems, we want to give that building a new birth date, and therefore we call that renovation age. Back in 2013, as you can see here, Ithaca had a fairly favorable age profile with more than half of its space in that blue and gray section under 25 years old. That story, however, as we look out to 2018 and 2023, was shifting quickly. And by 2023, Ithaca's space profile was shifting, was projected to be dominated by space over 25 years old in that orange and light blue area. Tim? Yes, uh, thanks, Caroline. In, in full disclosure, folks, when I first saw this slide, it, it was both sobering and a wake-up call. Uh, the fact that 38% of the physical campus was aging into the over 50 category, it really, really got my attention, and, and quite candidly, um, it helped me to get the attention of the senior folks uh, and the trustees. Um, now, if you recall, I'm just beginning to develop a master plan. And this chart only reinforced for me that our master plan and condition audit had to be linked. The last chart that we want to introduce from the ROPA Plus data is that of the total asset reinvestment need at Ithaca College on a dollar per gross square foot. This is from our ROPA model where we estimated the asset reinvestment need at Ithaca to be higher than peers and at our database average at close to $100 per gross square foot. This number, however, um, for those on the call who are familiar with Sightlines, was only an estimate based off of our database. It didn't give Tim or the Ithaca team enough direction or insight into how to tackle the growing level of need. Uh, absolutely right, Caroline. We, we didn't have enough information at this point for me to to share this with the senior leaders or to even begin to make decisions. Um, 
I, I did mention uh, a few moments ago that in 2011 I, a report was done, and when I picked it up in 2014, um, it appeared to me by looking from looking at the data that we were not using the findings that that had been um, captured in that report. Um, furthermore, another thing I found was that our backlog was growing. The 2011 report indicated. $251 million in deferred maintenance needs. When I compared that to an older report that I was able to put my hands on from 2007, which was when Ithaca College first began to work with, with sight lines, that number was only $167 million. So between 2007 and 2011, our need had grown by $84 million. I was getting very nervous at that juncture, thinking, OK, now we're going to do this again. How, how bad is the news going to be now? So to summarize uh, where we were uh, at that point, our campus was, I was finding that our campus was built during a time of low quality construction. We were getting older, and our total asset reinvestment need was above our peers and our database levels. I, I truly felt like, you know, welcome to Ithaca, Tim. Uh, this was, again, this wasn't uh, told to me in the uh, interview, but, uh, you know, being a facilities person like many of you out there, we, we take such challenges and we move on, and, and that's exactly what we did. Great. To come back to Monopoly, is facilities management like Monopoly? As Tim was beginning to see and feel that maybe the, the key similarity between facilities management and Monopoly is that without a plan, we're likely to lose, and certainly not as drastic as in the game of Monopoly when we pick up a card and all of a sudden we're, we're in jail, there are certainly risks associated with not having a plan when you're facing the challenges as Ithaca was. Those things are increasing our blind spots, wasting our money. Our risk profile will grow and we'll miss those opportunities. So when we don't have a plan and we're going in blind, far more likely that we're going to run into some pretty big roadblocks that are going to be pretty costly. And I think Tim has a, a few examples that he'll walk us through. Sure. Um, per the title of this slide, losing is not fun. Um, this slide is from a presentation that I actually made to the Ithaca campus uh, just last month, uh, early in May. Uh, the picture, it provides an unfortunate, um, shows an unfortunate event on campus. Uh, but. I always look at these kinds of things as opportunities to get folks' attention. Um, but the specific event was back in uh, March 4th of 15. Uh, candidly, another date which will live in infamy for me. Uh, we experienced an underground uh, high, high voltage electrical fault. The good news is that no one uh, was injured. Unfortunately, we actually had to cancel classes and activities in five of our buildings on a very busy mid-semester day. So not a good day for me. Not a good day for our team, but silver lining, this, this event, this, these pictures actually provided an opportunity for me to tell the deferred maintenance story. The next slide is actually also from the same presentation that I just referenced. Um, the, uh, what I've tried to do here is to, to treat deferred maintenance needs and system failures as teachable moments. And when you need a good definition, where do you turn to? Well, I go to good old Wikipedia. It actually provides a definition of deferred maintenance that I could really use to help folks you know, who are, are not facilities folks to understand what, what all this means. And you know, just to quickly read it, deferred maintenance is the practice of postponing maintenance activities in order to save costs, meet budget funding levels, or realign available budget monies. And the implications are, are clear to all of us on the call, but things like asset deterioration and impairment and, and continued failures and so forth. Um, an important point, and I, I'm always careful on this. I, I was and I continue to, to say that I never blame prior regimes for the backlog and the challenges. Uh, rather, the, the clause that speaks to me within that definition that I just read uh, realigning available budget monies. I believe that's probably what's happening at some of your institution and, and, and institutions and certainly what happened here at Ithaca. If you recall from that previous slide, I mentioned 31 percent of our buildings have been constructed in the current complex time frame. Well, what that means, folks, is that IC has been dedicating 
a ton of its capital dollars to new construction and, and not to deferred maintenance. This is not atypical in higher ed, as many of you already know, but uh, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to make sure that, um, and I always make sure that I mention that in any presentation that I'm giving, that I'm not being um, unkind or disparaging the prior regimes, the folks who preceded me. They were, they were busy constructing. I'm now busy trying to address the deferred maintenance backlog. Thank you, Tim. Before Tim um, changes gears a little bit and begins to talk to us about that building portfolio solution or the facilities condition assessment, I wanted to just walk through what that approach is at Sightline. Many facilities condition assessments, um, as you are probably aware, share the goal of cataloging all those building system needs across your campuses. They do this by inventorying your space through a physical walkthrough. In the end, you are given a long list that sometimes has thousands of items worth of need that tells you this HVAC system in this building is X many years old, needs replacing at this cost, et cetera. This is what I'll refer to on the slide as a technical assessment. Sightline does the technical assessment as well. We send a team to walk your building campuses as we did with Ithaca, where we inventory all of your needs tell you when that needs to be addressed, um, in what building, what's the criteria, et cetera. However, where our building portfolio solution service might differ is in the strategic piece. Instead of leaving an institution with that long list, and that's just about it, we also provide that strategic component by finding what we feel is the best way to segment building need into more manageable bites we allow an institution, as we did with Ithaca, to understand their funding options. So this is where we actually begin to segment your buildings, group them by like similarities, um, identify what are the resources available at Ithaca or your institution, and then actually help you create that multi-year capital investment plan. This is important because we know that we have lots and lots and lots of buildings across our campuses. As Tim mentioned in his introduction, there's 87 at Ithaca alone. Some are brand new. Some have been around even before the institution was founded. And these buildings across our campuses have very different needs, which require very different funding strategies because, as we know, these buildings are not created equal, and therefore our approach has to be customized. So one of the ways that we can do that through the Building Portfolio Solution Service is actually to create some building portfolios. So what you'll see on this slide is the various ways that an institution might be able to categorize their building portfolios. So listed on our property cards are a few different ways. We can simply approach our buildings by their function. So can we can create those portfolios based off of academic buildings, based off of athletic, based off of residential, and the funding for those various areas might be a bit different. Or we can approach them in terms of the mission. Does this building support, if we're a research institution, our mission to find the best students? Um, or lastly, let's talk about net asset value, which is the direction that Ithaca went. We can look at our replacement value less our building needs over our replacement value and create a percent good by building where we can actually segment the building condition and then adapt or have our funding follow in that suit. So again, various different ways we can group our buildings when we're looking at portfolios, which will then help us to streamline the, the large amount of need that that we identify when we do that technical assessment. Tim? Ah, uh, yes, data. Uh, said differently by someone smarter than me, trust in God, all others use data. And uh, this approach has actually served me well. In a prior life, as Eric mentioned during the introduction, I actually served as the Director of Continuous and Qual uh, Quality Improvement at a uh, university. So I've always been a database decision maker uh, therefore, as, as I got into this process, I couldn't gamble by rolling the dice, uh, not when our campus was changing and aging at a fairly rapid rate. Um, 
I, I really knew that in order to put Ithaca in the winner's circle, um, I needed more data. So that's what I sought to do, to collect. Uh, here's another slide from that presentation I referenced earlier. Um, essentially, in the first bullet, I told my campus community that we have a challenge and how are we going to address it. And I explained that we were linking our deferred maintenance backlog directly into the master plan. Um, the second bullet shows that you know what our process was, and Caroline kind of alluded to it there. The the second bullet, second minor bullet there, speaks to the, the involvement of sight lines where they walk the campus with us. Um, I was able to get a local engineer who, who was kind enough to help us with this analysis. Um, he knows our campus well, knows our mechanical systems well. Um, we, we talked to members of the campus community. We looked at our work order data. And most importantly, I was very careful to include my facilities team members not only the supervisors, but the frontline folks, the people who, who know where the problems are, the people who nurse the boilers through very challenging winters, the people who know where the roof leaks are when we're about to get deluged with a rainstorm. So the, I can't emphasize enough the success of our initiative was largely predicated on the involvement of my team. Uh, the final bullet there just talks about an extensive and elaborate triaging process. And that's, you know, in, in a few slides, you'll, I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit more, but essentially there's a whole bunch of projects when you, when you sit and look at your entire campus. And to triage those into the most important and the next important and so on um, took some time, took some effort, but it was, a, uh, it was well worth the effort. And again, the, all the groups that are mentioned there in that second sub-bullet in, in the second area of the slide really came together and were able to uh, help us to triage into a, into a real dynamic um, set of, uh, of uh, project goals around deferred maintenance. So the result of those efforts that I just mentioned, uh, as Caroline mentioned about the technical component, well, this slide illustrates that. This is our building portfolio system assessment. Um, all of the effort that we put into it resulted in this. And you will recall that the 2011 report that I mentioned that I found on my bookshelf had $251 million in deferred maintenance. You'll recall that that was a significant increase from 2007. So I was nervous that this was going to be a huge number. I think our efforts helped it to be the number that you're looking at, $175 million. Well, there's a few other reasons for that as well. But you're, at first blush, 175 million versus where we were at 251 four years, uh, three, or, three or four years prior, pretty good news, right? Well, yes and no. The good news is obviously that it is lower. Uh, and there were a couple reasons why it was lower specifically. In addition to, as I said, the, the hard work that we put into this, including an engineer so we had accurate pricing, those kinds of strategies were, were very helpful. I just I want to make sure that I also mention to you, however, that we did not include Butterfield Stadium, which needs a, its own analysis, and it's it's a complicated matter that I won't get into here. But we've got some challenges up there, so we didn't include Butterfield Stadium, and our underground utilities. We didn't include those. We are essentially in a in a mode of find it and fix it, and I have a very talented staff, and it's not the ideal way to go, but it's it's getting us through right now. So. The 175 million you're looking at, that was the good news. The real bad news for me was the time frame A data of $98 million. Uh, r remember, I'm a new CFO, I'm starting a master planning process, and now I'm looking at roughly $33 million a year for the first three years if I wanted to attack this in its, in its present form. I couldn't do that. My senior leadership, <laughs> quite candidly, did not see this slide. I immediately got in touch with, with sight lines and said, hey, let's work together. We need to figure something out. Um, and I'm going to explain on the next slide what we did. But before we move to the next slide, just a word on the condition audit process of any campus. This is something that I found, which and this is part of being the rookie CFO that I mentioned earlier. I think many of you will agree that failures uh, you know, of our mechanical systems, our envelope systems, they seem to happen all the time, and they do. Um, the, the process of assessing every system in every building 
has also, for me, underscored the fact that we also have systems that far outlive their life expectancies. Deferring those systems a bit longer with good data and analysis behind the decision making is a reality that really, for us, saved the day and the budget. You know, that 50-year-old boiler that you think has to be replaced, sometimes looking closely at it, maybe you can get a few more years. And we were able to do that, and that helped us. So the next slide, you'll notice a new addition to the right side of this graph. And I call it the quads dilemma, um, or to borrow from a nursery rhyme, the quads stand alone. And what that means is we have a 10 building cluster of residence halls that were built original to the campus. They're built like fortresses. They are, the roofs don't leak. They are mechanically sound. They, they have independent boilers in them. So every two to three years, we might have one boiler go. Um, so for 17 or 18,000 bucks, we replace that boiler and we keep on chugging along. Work orders, nothing extravagant. Uh, yes, the windows are not efficient. Um, the program space on the inside of these buildings is not ideal for our student life folks. I get that. I understand that. Um, but instead of spending $36.5 million to upgrade these quads, right now I've convinced our, our senior leadership that we probably should press pause on that process. Now what that did, obviously, was enable us to lower that time frame A category significantly. Um, so where we were in November of 2014 now, we're well into the master plan, well into our condition audit. Our master plan was really beginning to take shape. We knew we had steady enrollment and we weren't going to be increasing the size of our institution. We knew that we weren't going to be adding any significantly new or expensive academic programs that might require new buildings. So the president and the trustees were seeing this slide for the first time and really understanding our deferred maintenance needs. So I felt like I was really making significant progress at this juncture. Great. Thanks, Tim. So as Tim mentioned, the technical assessment provided Tim by time frame the, the level of need. And then through efforts on Tim and his team's behalf, they were able to bring that time frame A down by close to $30 million. We know, however, that capital planning is more than just a project list. So what we began to look at is how we can segment the buildings by net asset value. Just as a refresher, this is your replacement value, less your building needs or the deferred maintenance of your building over your replacement value. And the result is a percent good. So it's the inverse of the FCI. So consider the top of the board, the blue and green properties where we have, for those um, Monopoly fans, your park place properties and your boardwalk properties. And if you play Monopoly with me, that's, those are the properties that you're gunning for from the start. This is what we'll consider our capital upkeep stage, where our highest net asset value buildings lie. So here we're going to keep these properties up to date. We're going to uh, put our effort on PM here, and we're going to make sure that we're doing annual and monthly inspections to ensure that our building systems are going to reach or exceed their useful life. As we move counterclockwise, we hit the repair and maintain properties. Um, buildings here have net asset value between 70 and 80 percent. And at this juncture, we have the luxury of picking the projects. So our buildings might have some light wear and tear, but as a facility team, we're able to pick and choose where we are going to invest. As we move to the bottom of our monopoly board, we hit our systemic renovation stage. These are properties with a net asset value from 60 to 70 percent, properties that we really need to keep our eyes on. Projects might be picking us here. Building systems are aged, and there is a level of catch-up required. And lastly, the group of buildings that fall in our transition and gut renovation stage, buildings with a net asset value of 60 percent or lower, often require total overhaul. A lot of deferred maintenance here. A lot of funding is required to bring these buildings back to life. Um, in recent times, we're thinking about demolishing these buildings or selling them off in an effort to decrease our deferred maintenance. So as Tim moves forward and talks to us about net asset value, we want to understand that certain buildings have different percent good 
and how we treat those buildings has to be unique. Tim, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, per this slide, folks, uh, strategy absolutely outplays chance. Uh, at the lower left is the actual cover of the Ithaca College completed master plan, uh, which was uh, May of 2015. So we got this thing done in just, just about uh, 14 months, which I was very, very pleased with. Uh, at the right uh, is an actual page that resulted from our condition audit process. And for me, this is the ultimate example of how we linked our deferred maintenance challenges to our master plan. And the slide that you're looking at now is an actual page. This is, this is the blown up page. And if you look at the, uh, the legend there, it talks about building need as net asset value via sight lines. That's right in our master plan. Red buildings have the greatest need and green the least. Now, you'll recall that I noted earlier, Ithaca College is a residential campus. The, build, the red buildings, again, these are the buildings with the greatest needs, are all, all, with only one exception, residence halls. So that was eye-opening and very telling for us. So linking the condition audit data to our master plan was working exactly as I had hoped. I was able to illustrate to our campus community the challenging situation that we were in. I think we can move on, yep. Great. So as Tim and I discussed, we were able to look at the building condition and we'll call that our net asset value. So we really wanted to be able to link the master planning initiative into the site lines data and vice versa. So what Tim and his team did, and I'll allow Tim to expand on this in just a minute, is actually define the program value by building. And then we were able to marry the two in this two by two matrix, which really matches your building condition on the x axis uh, from poor to excellent to the y of program value from low to high. And there's four key areas here. When we have a building condition that's poor matched with a building with a high program value, we'll call these candidates for major capital renovations. These are the buildings that we have an excellent program in them, but the building itself does not match that. So we'll want to target those one-time funds to really reset the clock on those buildings. As we move to the right, we're seeing buildings with a high net asset value and high program value. These are the buildings that we want to keep in this quadrant for as long as possible. So we're going to use our stewardship funds or our keep-up funds, such as preventative maintenance, for major maintenance funding to really invest in an annual basis to make sure those building systems are meeting their useful life. As we come down to the bottom right, where our building condition is excellent, but our program value is low, we want to look at how we can either maintain these buildings until we can find the appropriate program or repurpose them right away. And lastly, the, the top quadrant is where we have low building condition with low program value. And these are the buildings where we're either going to look to rid ourselves by demolition or selling, or we have to really consider a major investment here, which sometimes isn't quite worth the return that you'll get. And Tim, I'll hand it over to you to walk through how you were able to define program value. Sure, sure. As a former CQI guy, I really like this two by two matrix. Uh, the visual was really appealing to me, and I knew that populating this matrix would really continue to help me to sell the story of our deferred maintenance needs. Um, if we could move to the next slide, um, just a, a real quick few comments here. The, this did for us become a powerful decision-making tool. It, it truly coordinated two important sets of data that Caroline just mentioned. Again, the, the, the uh, x-axis, the building condition, or the technical component, that's the stuff that we put together with Sightline's help, my team, the engineer, and so forth. The y-axis, program value to the institution, or the strategic component. Now, the challenge. Who should define program value on any institution? Well, we had some options. It was initially thought that I, that I would be able to do this. I was a new person on the campus. I had a uh, diversified background. In the past, I've worked in academic affairs and other divisions. So there were, that was the thought. But 
I put the brakes on that very quickly. I said there was no way. I could almost hear the cries from faculty, what does this facility guy know about my academic program? And I've, I've cleaned that up, by the way. I could have used far stronger language. Um, we thought about deans and VPs, and we decided that wouldn't be a good idea either because of the turf wars, there have been epic turf wars. We needed an independent, dispassionate party. So we opted to engage our master planners. And again, that was Perkins Eastman, the firm out of New York City. They used the scale, as you see along the, uh, the program value axis there. One would be program values that are on the low side, and five, the highest uh, valued programs. But how would they plug in programs? Well, they would use two sets of data that they became aware of during their work on our campus. They would use qualitative data, which were town hall feedback, survey data, focus groups that they held with, with every constituent on our campus. And they also used quantitative data. I mentioned earlier that our enrollments were going to remain steady. They looked at space utilization data. So those things together enabled them to kind of plug in buildings, programs, uh, the program value for our buildings. So the net, this net asset value chart will be a living document for me and for my team going forward. Uh, I'm already seeing that as we invest in buildings, we can move them from one quadrant to the next. And I hope that over time I'll be able to provide to the senior leadership uh, some real specific examples of how the resources that we are investing in our various buildings are paying dividends by actually moving them, as an example, from a major capital renovation into a stewardship area. So at this point, I, I feel that, that we are truly moving away from the chance pile. We've taken um, the one to three year time frame that you saw earlier, the time frame A time, uh, time period project list, and we've established a five year uh, strategic plan that is going to enable us to, to address uh, just a plethora of our deferred maintenance. Um, you might wonder how we elongated that time frame A, because if you think back to that slide, time frame A is typically one to three years. Well, we elongated that into a five-year plan to make it more palatable. Um, and the way I did that is probably more art and science than, than either or. Uh, but the result, as I've noted here on this slide, is that we've, we've changed our operation. Uh, operationally, we have changed on our campus. We used to be reactive. When our Williams chiller failed, it was an emergency replacement in the middle of the semester. When heavy rains are in the forecast, and I suspect some of you listening may be in the same mode, you deploy the bucket brigade. You know where the water is going to come down, and you, you get the buckets out, and the folks just know. Well, that was before, and now we are moving into the proactive mode, which is having the five-year strategic financial plan to address in a systematic way. And when I say systematic, when we look at the next slide, we see that here are years two through five of the, of the five-year plan. Year one I did not include because it, it ended this past May 31st, the end of our fiscal year. But this chart shows our early thinking on projects for years two to five. And I say early thinking because this is a living, breathing document. Things can change, and we may need to move things earlier or later. But you'll notice that some projects are very specific. If you look under year two, you'll see Friends Elevator. You'll see Terrace Dining, a couple of boiler jobs, uh, all of which, by the way, are well underway here during our summer uh, project uh, time period. Others speak to larger overarching themes that will require multiple fiscal years. If you look under year two, the second to the bottom, you'll see roof initiative. And right next to it, in year three, you'll see roof initiative. And if you jump over two more to year five, you'll see roof initiative. Well, we have decided that we need to replace a bunch of roofs. We can't do it all at once, so we've triaged them and we've segmented them out. We're doing about seven roofs this summer. We did a few last summer. Next year, we'll do some more. We're doing the same type of approach with our exterior stair replacement. Up here in Ithaca, our, our exterior stairs take a real beating with salt and uh, the harsh winters. So we've got a lot of work to do on, on those exterior stairs. Window replacements, the same way. So this, uh, similar to the, the previous slide, 
uh, or a couple slides ago, I should say, this, this is also going to be a living document or a work in progress. We revisit this each August when we finalize our deferred maintenance projects for the following year. And a quick footnote, the project funding process here at Ithaca is it's a bit complicated to explain. Those of you who may have looked at the totals at the top uh, of, for each year, when you total those up, you'll see we're spending less than the required $12 million during the five years to, a, to meet that $60 million uh, number that you saw a couple of slides ago. Well, this was presented to the campus community as the deferred maintenance bucket. We have other buckets of capital funding, and within those buckets there are also deferred maintenance projects ongoing. So it, it does, it adds up, but I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't confusion around that point. So to wrap things up, our, our goal was to link deferred maintenance directly into our master plan. And I would say that it's been a very successful marriage. I hosted both Sightlines and our master planning group here on campus for a half day meeting very early in the process. It was, it was a really terrific interaction. Both groups enjoyed meeting and interacting with the other, and it really paid dividends. Um, under the steps taken, there was continuous sharing of data between not only those two firms, but myself and my team were, were squarely in the loop at all times. Uh, we maximize the involvement of our frontline folks. And by the way, I mentioned previously the importance of that. And one thing perhaps that I didn't underscore is the boost in morale that that provided. Frontline folks who band-aid systems together, and I talked about the bucket brigade, and you know, the bucket brigade can get, they can, their morale can, can kind of disappear if there's no hope in sight. So for folks to have been involved in the process, and maybe the roof that, that the building that they're working in isn't going to be replaced this year or next year, but they know that their feedback has resulted in it being replaced in three years, it's really helped our morale considerably. Um, and then the final item within the steps taken talks about narrowing down and identifying critical needs. That's that elaborate triaging process that I mentioned. So the outcome our master plan and deferred maintenance spending were approved in May of 2015. That was the initial year of approval for the deferred maintenance. And subsequent to that, um, in the, at the October board meeting, uh, a five-year deferred maintenance specific project and financial plan was, was uh, approved and, and put in place. So our next steps, well, the work will continue to ensure that our master plan and our condition audit are living and breathing documents. Uh, I, met, I referenced this earlier, but in August we will roll up our sleeves. My team and I will begin pouring over the data you've seen today, and we'll also be considering new items that have recently come onto our radar. <laughs> As you can imagine, uh, this happens all the time. This morning, a very expensive one came onto my radar that we actually have on our sight lines list for next year, but I'm going to have to do it this summer, and it's not going to be inexpensive. So those things happen. So in summary, I'm very pleased with where Ithaca College is currently. We're in a far better place in our future direction as it pertains to our existing physical campus. Seems to be quite positive and encouraging, not only to my team, the folks who do the hard work, but also to the rest of the campus as well. Great. Thank you, Tim. And just some executive takeaways um, for some themes that the rest of us can take away based off of Ithaca's story. Um, how do we outplay chance at our institution? Well, we know that getting a seat at the table is not a given. So as Tim discussed, use the data that we have to support your case to drive greater buy-in. So invite your frontline facilities folks, share it with your CFO, bring those people to the same table. Maybe we know this um, far too well, but your bank is not limitless. So adopting a portfolio strategy that narrows the scope of your need to more manageable components, as we saw with the net asset value and the program value at Ithaca, can only help us streamline that need and create greater buy-in. Taking a card from the chance pile yields too much risk. So we want to make sure that we're sharing our data to involve more than just your facilities team so that we can avoid keeping our data in a silo and having greater communication and greater transparency creates, again, greater buy-in across all university constituents. And lastly, rolling the dice 
is a risk that you cannot take. So keeping your data up to date and relevant. Um, as Tim mentioned, the building portfolio solution is only good if you continue to triage and monitor and update that need. So doing all these things together helps us, or helps us to avoid pulling from that chance pile. So thank you all for your time. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Eric for any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you, Tim and Caroline. That was great. Um, surprisingly, as of right now, there have been no questions uh, submitted. Um, so while we wait for some to trickle in, um, I, I'll, I'll cover some, some additional information here. <clears throat> I'd like to let you all know that you will be receiving a post-webinar survey at the conclusion of today's session. It's a quick five-question survey that should probably only take about a minute or two to complete. And it's really designed to not only get your thoughts on the content of today's presentation, but to also get a sense for the challenges that you face on campus, and with those in mind, what topics you'd like to hear from Sightlines at future events. I'd also like to make sure that I encourage you all to visit the Sightlines website and our Insights page if you'd like to stay current with facilities trends and any of the latest best practices or innovative facility solutions that we share. Insights is your resource uh, to easily access industry knowledge from both Sightlines and our member institutions. There you'll find blog posts, articles, webinar recordings, where, you'll, where that's where you'll find this session um, located, and more information on upcoming events. You'll also have the opportunity to sign up for our monthly newsletter. So please be sure to check that out from time to time as we frequently update this page with new information. And lastly, for everyone on the call, and I'm really excited to talk about this, if you want to hear more of these types of success stories and also have the opportunity to connect, collaborate, and network with peers in your area, I encourage you to check out our 2016 Insights Workshops. These workshops are a unique series of regional events created as a result of the tremendous response to our Insights Summit from last year. Uh, as you can see from the image on the screen, we'll be hosting workshops at five different venues across the country, which will allow us to explore regionally focused issues and, and design a strategic solutions driven workshops that are, are relevant and tailored to you. Uh, so again, I encourage you all to check that out. All the event details are located on our website. And I hope you take advantage of this opportunity by registering for the location that, that's most convenient for you. Uh, if you have any questions about our Insights Workshops, please don't hesitate to contact us following today's session. Um, so it looks like we have a question or two now. The first question is for Tim. Um, is Ithaca motivated to prioritize this effort and investment based on straightforward stewardship? Uh, keeping up operating costs, keeping operating costs in check, or because it's the least uh, of data around recruitment and retention of talent. Eric, I apologize. Can you can you repeat that? I was, it, it didn't come through very clearly. I apologize. Sure. It is Ithaca motivated to prioritize this effort and investment based on straightforward stewardship, um, keeping operating costs in check, or its belief in data around the recruitment and retention of talent. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because it's there's a lot of information there. What I, and I and if this doesn't get at it, hopefully the uh, the person can either email me separately or or re ask the question. But what we're trying to do, in addition to uh, dedicate a great deal of resources and effort to the deferred maintenance agenda, we have also upped our efforts in the preventative maintenance area. We've restructured in a way that enables um, much more systematic, much more uh, uh, planned maintenance to occur. The um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, and I, I apologize. Oh, that, that's okay. Any yeah, any questions that we can't address, or maybe you need some additional clarification, we'll um, yeah, I'll connect with with Tim, you, and Caroline afterwards, and we'll reply if there's if there's sure. if we need to expand on some of the some of the answers here. Um, another question uh, can. Can you reiterate how you determine program value? And that may be for both uh, Tim and Caroline. Sure. I'll start from my perspective. The program value, uh, it was a one through five scale and lower, lower valued programs. And I'll give you an example. If, if, and I'm not sure if, if as I'm talking, Eric, if you could bring up the uh, slide uh, where we've got some of our buildings populated in there. Um, okay. So when you see at the bottom 
right quadrant, you'll see a bunch of diamonds at like with a 90%. Okay, that means those buildings are in great shape, but the program value is not all that important. Good examples of buildings there, the building that I'm in, the facilities building, doesn't have a program value that's, that's significantly important to the institution. The president's house is one of those. So um, public safety, our mail center, those are buildings that were built probably within the past two decades and are in very good shape, but programmatically, when you compare them to the academic buildings and our business school and so forth, they they don't rank value-wise as being high. I hope that that answers the question. Caroline, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate. Sure. Thanks, Tim. I think um, maybe they're getting at how exactly did the um, Perkins Eastman actually define program value? Maybe you can discuss the focus groups that occurred and the use of sight lines data. Well, sure. The the focus groups, the surveys, and so forth really told the story of what's important here at our campus. And I'm not I, I'm not going to rank order our programs, but we were founded as a music conservatory, so that's the music building has a tremendously high program value. It's part of our mission. It's part of, of what we're known as, as is the communication school. So those buildings would be, located, would, be, would be rated much higher by Perkins Eastman based on the feedback they received during the qualitative data um, collection, but also the quantitative as well, where we look at usage. And if the music school is used, as is the uh, communication schools, to use those examples. They are used at all hours of every day and every night. You can walk through our music school at 2 a.m. and you hear students who are practicing in the individual rooms. So those would obviously have a very high program value. So both qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, the data kind of helped Perkins Eastman to make those judgments. And what I mentioned earlier about them being dispassionate reviewers, that, uh, that was a very successful way to do this because if the music school dean and another dean were, were trying to sort out where to place their buildings on this particular um, uh, rubric, it, it could get dicey. So the, the independent analysis was, was of great value. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Uh, another question here. Uh, how much effort and time did it take to get cabinet and faculty buy-in uh, of the program priority ranking performed by your master planning consultants? Um, it, it didn't take a great deal. It, it really didn't. We this was pr this was kind of shared in in the similar to the way it's being shared today, and it was shared as as a holistic view. Um, folks didn't push back uh, much on this at all, um, but we were careful to communicate throughout. We had town hall meetings um, throughout our master planning process, and not only were we asking about the future direction. We were explaining that we were doing something a little bit novel, I think. We weren't coming up with a master plan that was going to say, we're building a new business school on this piece of our campus in 2017, and then in three years later, we're going to tear that building down and do this. We really, we really approached this as a kind of a, a way to educate the campus that we need to fix and repair a lot of our systems. We're not going to be getting bigger, so there's not going to be a lot of new space, even though everyone thinks we need new space. Um, not everyone, but a lot of folks and I, on any campus. And I'm, I'm not speaking about the college now. I'm thinking about campuses in general where there's always a space crunch. And true, we have those as well. And part of my role here is to, to determine how we better use our space, but that's a, that's a different webinar. Um, but yeah, the, the campus, I think, was included. They were asked for their opinions. They were updated, and it was a uh, it was a, a, a good process. Okay, great, thanks, Tim. Um, let's cover running a little bit out of time. Maybe enough time for one more question. Um, so what was the process behind getting deferred maintenance be included in the master planning process? Uh, the, the the main the main reason was everything that we were hearing and, and all of the, the, the things that were hitting me very early on in my tenure as being major issues on this campus, an aging campus. Um, there was, we were, day one, as I mentioned, I'm in a master planning session. So now we begin to think about, and, and, and initially my thoughts were, okay, master plan, 
let's do exactly what I just mentioned a moment ago. Let's figure out where the next building is going, which buildings are coming down, what our campus is going to look like in 10, 15, 20 years. But the more I listened to what our current campus looked like and, and the challenges that we had, we had to make some very difficult decisions. So we, we determined that our master plan must include the deferred maintenance piece. We had to address that. Many institutions really struggle with how do you, how do you begin to get your hands around a massive deferred maintenance backlog. For me, it was very easy to link, link that problem into our master plan and kind of solve two things at once. We developed the master plan, and at the same time, we built right into it ways that we can effectively address our deferred maintenance backlog. OK, excellent. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, it appears that we're out of time. Uh, we do, if, I, if we have a couple more questions that have been submitted. Uh, so what I'll do is, in order to address those, I'll connect with Tim uh, following today's session, and we can, we can get some responses to you uh, within the next couple of days. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to thank you all again uh, for joining us today. I, I hope that you enjoyed the session and, and found the information valuable as you continue to explore ways to create a new facilities conversation on your campus. Please don't hesitate to contact us via our website, sightlines.com, or directly at insights at sightlines.com if you have any additional questions following today's call. Uh, we'll be in touch with to those who have submitted questions now. Uh, thank you again, and I hope you have a great day.